Well, kia ora koutou, no mai, hari mai. Uh, welcome to another Territory 3 session. Uh, very, very excited to uh, have Audrea Tops Hajo joining me from the USA. Welcome. Um, Thank you. Folks, I haven't been on for a while, so it's, uh, it's nice to, uh, to be connected to you all again. A um, little bit of housekeeping before um, I, I hand over to our guest uh, for a bit of an overview of her uh, really amazing uh, uh, life and career experiences and, and also some, some passion and purpose projects, which I'm really looking forward to getting into as well. Um, so we are on Zoom. You're all more than familiar with it, I think. Um, the key thing for us to help the host uh, maintain a sanity is if you have a specific question uh, during the session, we will stop at about minute 30 and then just towards wrapping up uh, just before 11 for uh, really getting through the Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, any chat, as, uh, as you all do, to say hi to each other and so forth is great, but just to make sure I don't miss anything in this uh, real opportunity, um, if you could make those questions specifically in the Q&A, which is, I think, next to the chat, depending on what sort of interface you're using. So um, without further ado, Audrey, welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, and yeah, where you've got to, I guess, as of today, chatting to us about all the things you do. Well, thanks, thanks for asking. So yeah, hi, again, my name is Audrea Tops Harjo. Um, I'm a native of uh, Washington, DC. Uh, I was a uh, theater major, dance minor in college at College of William & Mary. I went to um, film school at Howard University in Washington, DC and obtained my master's of fine arts in film. I, I was majored in uh, directing and uh, I've created three short films that were um, award-winning. My last thesis was nominated for Student Academy back in uh, the late 1900s, 93. Uh, and uh, after that, I moved over to um, uh, Los Angeles and I didn't know anyone. Uh, I just, I'd used the network that I built during the film festival and met a director and started working in um, low budget feature films as a first uh, assistant director in UPM and that they were the charge of logistics and money. And I, I did that for three movies and decided to start over as a PA for Universal because that was just more steady work and worked my way back up the food chain. Uh, I worked for a production manager, did music videos, worked for Disney Channel pilots, all those great things. And then I got hired to work at US Animation and that was a digital ink. I was working for David Lippman who went on to produce the Shrek uh, for DreamWorks. He's one of the first producers. I left, uh, working for him and went to go work for um, 10DB with Zalman King. I'm probably dating myself with David Duchovny started in a long time ago. I worked, worked two seasons with Zalman King and Butch Kaplan. Butch Kaplan went on to produce The Notebook and John Q. Um, I left uh, Butch uh, and we decided to um, go freelance. I was going to direct a movie, but it didn't didn't pan out like things do. They kind of come and go. And I ended up working um, freelance for a little bit and then working at Sony Pictures uh, and software. And so of course I didn't really know anything about software, but I knew how to organize and I was a, I was a fast learner. So when they asked me if I knew Perl or C++, I was honest and said no, but I was really good at telling people what to do. So that's what I did. And uh, I learned from the ground up and that point, you know, visual effects was just so new. We were all kind of learning it together. And I didn't know how lucky I was to, to, to think that I was able to, um, be with uh, the team uh, who, who just won an Academy Award for Forrest Gump. So Ken Ralston, Debbie Denice, Steven Rosenbaum, and Sheenan Dougal, they all came from ILM and they were the best teachers. So we, I worked on Contact, was my first um, big movie. I was a digital production manager, so I was responsible for um, film, uh, filming it in and getting it out and all the steps in between. I had a team of about 134 and uh, had an amazing crew. That's still to this day my favorite, favorite, favorite movie. Went from um, contact work on Starship Troopers and high-speed compositing. I worked on Godzilla, the, the Matthew Broderick version. And I was a uh, animation producer on Stuart Little. And then I was working on Spider-Man. Um, I worked on Hollow Man before that. I worked on Spider-Man and decided to call it quits and uh, start my own production company, making martial arts movie of all things. So I made a martial arts like little short movie and uh, I used Jet Li's writer and his stunt guy. And so I was able to kind of hang with this crew for a, a year. We got to go to Cannes, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and of course the things happened. I took some time off personally, had, had a kid, it was a mom, it was a single mom. 
uh, and uh, came back to LA after you know spending a year in DC um, with my with kid in tow and started working in visual effects again. So I worked on X Men Two and Garfield and Sky Captain with Jude Law, and then realized that big movies and little babies are hard to to balance. And so I ended up um, staying put in Playa Vista and Electronic Arts was in Playa Vista at the time. Again, I knew nothing about game development, but I, um, I, I learned quickly and they said, well, do you play games? And I was like, well, no. And they well, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I tell people to do really well. You're hired. So I started at the ground level again. So I went from producing to visual effects to like production, just managing um, the small teams and uh, Medal of Honor. I moved up to art development director and then after being on the console side for three years, moved over to the mobile side. And now I'm going to date myself again. That was when the iPhone came out, you guys. And so I worked my way up to running North American production and deployment in India after, after three years. Well, we seem to have lost Audrea at this stage. Hopefully she will come back as we've all seen uh, the freeze in Zoom. Sorry about this folks, but again, not a surprise. I think I've pretty much done everything on these now, including being on mute for one of our guests for the first 10 minutes, which was probably in my top 10 reel of most embarrassing moments on Zoom. I'm going to. Oh, so let me see. Uh, let me see. Am I back? Am I back? Yeah, I am. You Sorry, are you back. Yeah, yes, right. I was, yes. I was running out of. I yeah. was running out I mean, of banter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be honest. But, you know, I'm, I miss. I miss that Wellington broadband. I tell you, I miss it. I miss it. <laughs> but it is so good over there. Um, anyway, so um, where was I? So um, um, after um, I was at Electronic Arts, I, I, I got a call from Cindy Oates, who was running production over at Weta, and they were looking for a production manager for the creature department. And I flew over to Wellington for 48 hours. I felt like James Bond. I flew in, I met with the team, <laughs> back out, and they, I, the job was offered to me kind of as soon as I landed. And I packed up my gear and my little kid and we flew over to Wellington and I was there in January, 2021. And uh, I was sorry, 2011. And uh, yeah, I worked on um, 1010 Rise of the Apes, um, the Avengers and uh, just, it's just so many movies. I can't even, it's, it's all a blur, but I worked on nine movies in two and a half years, you guys. And uh, Weta is no joke. I mean, it was really not for the week to work over there. But over there, I, I hired a young TD called Derek Bradley. And uh, before I left, I, 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 he asked to be transferred over to the environments team, which I did. And uh, I left and came back to, uh, uh, I left Weta and that contract ended. And before I left, I, I told Joe Letiri, I, I love my time there, but it was time to go. Um, my dad, my dad had died suddenly, so it was time for me to come back and support my mom. Uh, but before I left, he's like, "Well, what do you like doing?" I was like, "Well, you know, I'm really good at supporting really intelligent, highly skilled artists." And he goes, "How do you feel about James Cameron?" I'm like, "Here we go." So I worked on Avatar. <laughs> I worked on Avatar. I was like, "Here we go." Uh, so I worked on Avatar for six months at Weta, and then when I um, uh, came back, John uh, uh, John Landau hired me to work at the Manhattan Beach. Uh, studios for six months, so I got to work on Avatar sequels for a year, which was which was very uh, fun. You know, you can't get any, you know, just top of the food chain. That guy uh, and that team was so bright, um, but it was tough. And um, they had shut down production for a time over the over the the years. It's been and and development. They would stop and start depending upon where the the scripts were. So that they just stopped production. So I came back to DC and create started um, a new. Um, team to make movies in DC. And so I trained up their producers and their team. I made three movies with them. And then um, uh, that's, and, and while on my off season, I would teach produ film production in China. I was in Beijing for a little bit and I taught in Curacao as well. And just off and on, just while we were not shooting. 
And then I got a call from Derek Bradley 10 years later saying that he had a new company called A44 that he had been uh, working with and he had a new title and he needed someone to kind of help him um, set a uh, structure for his new company and to kind of mentor him. And that's what I got called over and um, right before lockdown in February uh, 2020. And we all know what happened in March. So I was uh, in Wellington uh, from uh, that time until most recently when I left um, in August, end of August. And uh, in that time, uh, I created something during during our lockdown, something called Inclusion Effects, which is focusing on diverse voices and amplifying them in visual effects. Because when I realized when I worked in those spaces, I was generally the only one of the few women, one of the few, definitely one of the few women of color um, in most of those spaces, including the one I was cur currently in um, at A44. Um, and I really wanted that to change and that change only by um, showing that we are here, we do exist, and if if we can do it, so can so can you. So that was really the the four point at, and um, bringing in all of my amazing uh, uh, artists that I've worked with over the years. You know, Sheena Dougal, who's amazing. She's won a uh, VES Lifetime Award. She just finished working again with Tom Hardy for Venom Two. Um, Andrew Roberts, who worked on the um, Obi Wan. Uh, series for Disney, just all these amazing, amazing people. And please, if you have, and check out um, Inclusion Effects website. We're also on YouTube, and you can see all the. I think I, I believe I interviewed about eighty nine people over the course of two and a half years, and I, 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 I captioned people from Aotearoa, which is nice. Like they all kind of had a theme. So every panel, every two months or so, I, I kind of they all kind of come to me, and they all had a this incredibly synergy of saying the same thing. I never quite figured out how it happened. Like I pulled people from all over the world and the, the theme would emerge. So I guess it was just uh, kind of, you know, destined, but, um, but yeah, but it was, it was time. Derek's, Derek's team had matured really, really well. I really had kind of done all my, my job because I was really just there to guide the teams. And, uh, and, and I, I left to come over, back over to support my mom again and to make movies, which is my love. I do love making movies. I love making all entertainment to go back to my roots. Mm -hmm. And so I'm back in, I'm back in DC. And, and now we're today. I, I'm going to have to take a short break to absorb that, <laughs> that lifelong history. And um, <laughs> I've got so many questions, but the first one is, I, I just wonder how long your CV or, or LinkedIn profile would be if you printed it out, right? Um, it's, just it's it's a lot yes it's always a lot and look I didn't I missed the, the you know and, and um, I was really lucky when I was in at William and Mary I internship for the government so I skipped all my government work out I used to intern I was I was at the Department of Energy and the legal department which would serve me well uh, for four years so every break I would come and work for the government and I'd be right on the mall and I would go to a different museum this is the beauty of working in DC because like, all the malls are beautiful and you can kind of go in and get so much richness so that was nice being a little kid, but I did not want to work in government. That was, you know, when you do something, you're like, okay, yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I, I don't want to go to government. Thank you, but no, thank you. Yeah. Cool. They, should, they, they say sometimes that you should try everything at least once and then you know uh, whether you like it or not. Um, it's true, it's true. I'm going to rewind and it feels like, I don't know, what whatever metric you use, it feels like several miles back to where you started with a number of the things you talked about with yourself. And we've got a lot of founders who will watch this on demand and, and with us today. And really yes. our organisation is just about giving them insights about, you know, the things that will make the boat go faster for them as a business. But of course, you can't do that as you're growing without working out what you do yourself. And and you yes. mentioned several times um, that your reputation or your sort of, uh, it felt to me, I'm putting words in your mouth now, superpowers. Yes. Uh, you, yes. you call it telling people what to do. But I feel that's a, um, I feel that's a simplification because if you'd just gone around telling people what to do, I don't feel the career would have gone quite as far as. Um, so yeah. can you sort of expand on that as how you kind of um, embrace that as something that, you know, your brand. And, and the other thing I love about your, description of your roles, which I, I hear very rarely, is there's so many um, relativities to actual people who obviously build their brand around being, you know, an iconic or an aspirational kind of uh, embodiment of, of that role rather yes. than a, a role and a title. So whichever way you want to approach that, I guess it's like, you know, what, how, how did you evolve 
that realization of what you do and 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 then what 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 do you do to keep that as your um as your key sort of strength over a, a number of other things obviously yeah no that's a really great question so my my um my superpowers started really young you know i i my gift of organization and having to um order things started really young um i was an avid reader i couldn't read for a really long time i think i was a late reader and um, my mom would read to me constantly as a little kid, but instead of actually reading, I may have had some uh, learning, minor learning disability that wasn't diagnosed. Instead of actually reading the words, I memorized the entire library. So she thought I was reading, but I <laughs> memorized books. And finally, by the second grade, they're like, she's not reading. She goes, what are you talking about? I was like, well, I, was like I read to her every day, reading with me. It's like, cause I've memorized the entire library. Um, and so I realized really early that I had this crazy un, a prenatural uh, memory. And um, so when I did kick in to read, and of course my favorite book is now coming on AMC soon, Interview with a Vampire, of course, is my first book. Cause I, you know, forget the babysitter plug. I'll just go for Anne Rice. Uh, so, so that's what I did, just straight for the jugular, uh, figuratively. And um, I, I just never put a book down after that, but I couldn't, I couldn't just read it. I had to categorize it. I had note cards. I had ratings, I had synopsis, I mean, all in, this is before the computer. And I just needed to organize a large quantity of data, just something I was just really good at. And so when I started studying film and even in theater, theater, theater helps you just break down things at a really minute level. You know, you you start with a blank stage and then you have the words and out of the words you come, the material. So it was a wonderful foundation to do that. It was naturally something I enjoyed doing. Um, and so, translating that to film, the first AD in the UPM, that's all they do is kind of make the movie in their head and then execute against it. And so it was really easy for me to take that, that, that natural gift and just apply it to visual effects because we were all making it up. And so my knack was to take complex um, issues or, or new things and, and almost instantly see a breakdown of process and a through, a through line of how to make that happen, which, you know, which is like you said, simplifying that into telling people what to do. Because I was able to see it really quickly and it took me a long time to realize that everybody couldn't do that. And that was really my superpower. And I just leaned into that. Um, and everybody, because artists are so amazing and they're so that creative, um, um, chaotic uh, art artistry, um, what would happen was, would be that, um, uh, that you would need to, um, figure out how to uh, break down break, break down complex things and um, break down complex things and uh, simplify them so that your team can um, understand and uh, digest all that information so that they can execute against. And that's really, that was really what I would do uh, the whole time. Um, and I would just rinse and repeat and just make that make that better and so that's really probably what I would you know I would I would call that and it, and it really did matter because most of most of the time in when we were in a uh, visual effects everything was always always pretty everything was always um uh new and exciting and we we would never really know um what was going to happen so that we would uh it was always made up if that makes sense um, and uh, we would uh, have to, uh, I would be the person to kind of make sure that the, that the team knew what they were doing based upon um, their, what, what the task of hand. And because it was always a movie, we always could, we, we always knew what the end road would be. Now, when we were working in games, that was never, never the case because the games is like a, like a, like a, a sandbox and uh, you would uh, always have to, Games is a whole, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop right there because games is a whole different beast. I keep continuing on movies because movies are very linear and very orderly. I'm gonna take that aside and go to the next question. <laughs> I'm, 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 gonna... I'm gonna drag you back to games later because I think gamification is something we, <laughs> we just have to talk about with someone like yourself at some point in this um, session. But you know, that's, that's fascinating and immediately giving me parallels to starting a business of any type, um, being a yeah. founder. You know, having um, well, there's two two sides to the coin. I'm thinking of. I mean, you're either you've got this great vision for something you want to build for the world, and you need to find somebody who's actually going to be able to see the straight line, as you put it. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, and so my question to you is, um, you must also have a sub-skill to that about those that sit there, and I'm trying to fold my arms and, and, and sort of uh, and screen and say, yes, you know, uh, yes, we will, or yes, we understand. And really what they're thinking is, you know, who is this person? Why would I listen to them? I want to do it my way. So ha what have you learned to deal with that? Oh, so, so yes. In every single organization, there is there is that. Um, and so what I like to do is just get the lay of the land as quickly as possible, sometimes faster than they would like, because I've definitely been that that change agent, right? I'm definitely that person um, who kind of comes in because you you would call me when there is there's something that needs to be changed because what they were doing before wasn't wasn't working for them. Um, <clears throat> and so when I was working for John Landau and he asked me when I was interviewing, um, you know, what my, what my strength was and what, 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 what would I be like? I, I asked him if he saw La Femme Nikita and he was like, yeah, the Passat version. I was like, yeah, La Femme Nikita. He said, well, I said, well, you know, the cleaners, he said, yeah. I said, I'm a cleaner. He's like, oh, okay. I got it. You're hired. You know, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much like I'm the one with the dead bodies. Just call me and I will just fix it. And so that was my specialty, right? Because it was always kind of crazy. And I have to go in. So when when I when I, when I worked at Weta, the creature department was uh, was um, had almost four different departments in one department. It had software, and those guys won an Academy Award scientific for that wonderful facial work they did for Rise of Planet of the Apes. Um, there was the 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 claw simulation that did that beautiful Superman Man of Steel cape, and they also had the uh, claws with the digital doubles for the dwarves and all the monster work, those were simulation for muscles. And, and then we had taking all the 3D models that were made for by the models department with all the wonderful details and vertices and baking them down to the simplest form and sending it back down the pipeline and um, all running at the same time and, and trying to balance um, all of the departments. And that this is the first time I arrived that we weren't all working on Avatar. We we're now working on 10, 10 and Rise. And that had to develop a whole different pipeline and that created a, a really um, unique way of working. And I remember when I came over there, I, did, I was a, definitely a shock to the system. Their first question was, where did you serve the military? So that tells you how I arrived. <laughs> They're like, I said, I did not serve the military. I did not serve. I know I'd act like it, but no. But because I'm really clear, it all comes from like clear expectations and where you want to, um, where where you uh, uh, what what the overall goal is and what's the most efficient through line. Now look, you're right. Those people who fold their arms, they like it messy because when they're messy, then they could do anything they like. And what I do is start asking questions and holding people accountable. And the people who are doing they're supposed to, they love it. The people who are not, I find them very quickly, and they do not. <laughs> they don't love it. Love it. They don't love me. I hate that girl. Oh my god. Why is she here? She's a foreigner. Why? Who called her? We did not ask for her. <laughs> not for Lena. Call... <laughs> we did not call. Her. Why? <laughs> That's brilliant. And um, yeah, I just think so relevant because I'd imagine you know we hear these huge numbers around many of the productions you've talked about, but at the end of the day, the resources of anything you try and build are always limited, aren't they? Yes, it's true. You know, I, I think that's probably why I love Sony so much because that time Sony was so flush, right? They could bring the entire team. Like, who could do that? Who can flex like that, you know, to pay a supervisor? Like, we'll just drop you three million bucks as your salary for the year. Wow, you know, great. That's a lot of TVs. Um, but they could they could have they could afford it and um and all the resourcing. And look, I remember we only had two terabytes of space on that on that show. And now that can fit in your pocket. But back then that was like big bucks, you know, that was thousands and thousands of dollars and managing all that um, space and, and all that um, Maya licenses and render farms. And it was, it was, it was a pretty big deal too. It still is really, but it's, it's simplified a little bit, but the workflow and the artistry is, is, is pretty, still pretty amazing. But again, because I had, I leaned into my natural gift, which is, organizing really complex things and really seeing things in three dimensions and seeing things um, fit together. And because back then we didn't have a database to keep all the elements, I use, I would, I would keep that in my head, which is not, that's not as, that's, you shouldn't ask people to do that. <laughs> that's not nice. Like, do you have a photographic memory to make sure you have all the elements categorized in your head for over two and a half thousand shots? Go, let's do it. You know, I'm like, no, that's not fair. But now they have like shot grid and those things that 
can help people with tracking, but back in the day, it was really, you know, complicated to to put all that in place. But it was fun, you know, it was fun. It, it sounds fascinating. And this question, I guess, I'm going to start at a high level, but you go at it at whatever level you'd like, because I mean, I think you've got um, uh, we've got a wonderful opportunity here, given um, uh, our audience is generally taking something from New Zealand to the world to ask somebody who's, you know, in an industry, but also just generally as a culture has deeply experienced, you know, like the the ultimate, I guess, some would argue, you know, the US kind of entertainment scene, the New Zealand, yes. you know, we, we, we have a lot of pride and, and growth aspirations around. Yes. Give us the, give us the no frills uh, version of what you see the differences and the challenges being between us and, and elsewhere. It's a great question. I think, I think a lot of, uh, it's almost a blessing and a curse. I mean, you, you, New Zealand is such a unique position because you're far enough away to not really be influenced and kind of find your own way, which is really powerful in the sense that, oh, a boat can fly. Who would think of that? You know, like those are those are really good. <laughs> like, oh, there's a boat in the water. Why is it flying? But like those are really great, innovative um, challenges that's so unique because it's never been done before. I I always admire because the population is so tiny that younger people can get in really senior positions really quickly and just have the opportunity to do so. I mean, like, you know, Derek, I mean, he only had like three bosses and one of them was me before he founded his own company. And that's a blessing and a curse because you have, you're so young, you don't know what you don't know. And so you just do it, which is amazing because in your twenties, the sky's the limit. Like you're, you're invincible. You're never going to die. You're going to live forever. I mean, you have these amazing things. And so, and, 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 and with that, you know, the, the young women who I were my contemporaries uh, in, in uh, Wellington, like, you know, Jessica and, um, Cat from Wessler, like all these amazing women who've been doing it for 10 years now and they're still young and vibrant and have these amazing ideas. I think that's really great because you have the opportunity. In the Americas, not so much because it usually takes 10 years to rise up the ranks and another 10 to kind of understand the complexity of running a, a, a global brand in that sense of countrywide. And then now you're in your 50s or, or 60s and then you're ready to cash out and retire. So um, but, but but the other thing that, that that comes with it because it's it's such a, um, uh, a incubative space, the the maturity level of the the team is is really limited um, because I don't because everybody's so so nice. I mean, <laughs> there's no there's no there's no there's I, there's no reason why, and and I, I got a lot of feelings. Uh, and and feelings are so important, but at the bottom line, it's really the work. And so I would get a lot of, but I tried hard. And I'm like, but it's not done. And I can't really, <laughs> I, 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 I admire your effort, but if it's not done, then it, it kind of doesn't count. They would lose their minds. What? You know, are you trying to discount my feel? I'm like, but somebody has to do it you know, are you gonna do it try to find somebody else to do it especially when you want the international standard right because this is what you this is what's required and again it's on the it's on the huge extreme i mean i i learned so much working in new zealand because the work-life balance is real it's like you would go to a place is it supposed to be open now you know <laughs> off hiking <laughs> it's like are you are you gonna work today or is, should i call first i mean those are the things but 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 as a holistic, as a um, keeping the, the mind, body, spirit for long term, that's a lot more healthy. But it all depends on what you want. It's almost like you can't have your cake and eat it too. And the reason why my, I was I was I was laughing, my time limit in New Zealand's always like at the two and a half year mark, because the first year they're going to go with me. OK, what's the new structure? And then the third the first year, the second year is almost OK, let's solidify that standard. And then the half the year, it's like, well, how can we kind of kiwiize it? Because I'm a pioneer and not a settler. So I still need to take whatever blueprint I've given you. And now you have to infuse it with your own local flavor because you guys are the ones that have to carry it. Because I, you know, I'm, I'm still a stranger in a strange land um, over here. And I'm just here to kind of guide as much as possible. And so when when young founders or a team get to a point where they're kind of running smoothly i have job add and i have to go and conquer 
more windmills and mountains because that's what I, I like creating new stuff. I don't like kind of sitting there and just watching the grass grow. I mean, it's good. And some people like it. Some people come in, they do their thing, but I really love the innovative, um, of, can we do that different? Can we do it better? Definitely be that change agent. And I remember going in a COO with uh, working at, at 844 and I was really specific. Mine is gonna be the change agent and the support and mentor of the young CEO. And like once he's like, where'd you, I got it. You know, it's like, yes, you do. You live here and you know, I'm missing my family since I've been away for so long. You know, it's definitely time for me to to go back. But um, but no, I I I I've taken some of that um, balance with me because uh, before, you know, when when you're in Los Angeles and there are thousands of people that want to do your job, and there's if you can't do it at that moment, you're replaced. There's no second chances, um, and that creates an interesting work environment. There's no, can I get some more help or I you know. <laughs> And I think something has happened during the pandemic as well, right? Because people are like, I will turn off this Zoom, the end, right? <laughs> I don't have to put up with this anymore. I don't have to see you, have you. <laughs> Especially the young kids it was so cute. We were interviewing some, some kids in Auckland out of media design school. And I swear, hand to heart, he was so adorable. He was like, um, can you just build a new studio in Auckland for me? Because I'm not moving down. I was like, oh my God, you're adorable. <laughs> I was like, we're not going to build a new studio for you. You're 12. We're not going to build a studio for you because you like your chair and your house. Absolutely not. But that was, he thought that was a legitimate ask. And I thought it was very funny. <laughs> it, it reminds me, you know, as I've described it sometimes in terms of us trying to globalize, um, you know, everybody generally speaking loves uh, Jermaine and Brett from Flight of the Concords. But at the same time, no one would put them in charge of a mission time critical project to to deliver on time and under budget, right? It's true. It's true. And I've, I've found a lot of it, you know, and I'm all for the work-life balance, but somebody had to do it. And, and, and you know, full disclosure, it ended up being me. I was the one, you know, my funnel wasn't here. I was the final, I was kind of the army of one. And so what everybody was kind of going off for Christmases and child emergencies were like to completely understand, but the work still had to go on. And so over time, Time, I just started getting burnt out and um, they're like what's wrong I'm like what do you mean what's wrong I'm here by myself <laughs> I'm doing all the work that you're not doing <laughs> what do you why do you think I'm angry you know <laughs> it's like, I'm, this is not fun for me you know <laughs> but uh, but it wasn't oh, I, don't, fault. I, I don't want to traumatize you with this next question <laughs> but I have to ask it because I did one of my first ventures which we sold in the U.S. was a performance management company and, you know, a lot of my office hours uh, with founders are the classic stage. And you sort of highlighted a little bit from your experiences. You know, we've got Jane. You know, Jane's been great to a point. Um, but Jane isn't the person that can take the company to the next level. And there isn't yeah. an obvious place for Jane to do something productive to the, to the, to the side. And then I guess is the, you know, Jim uh, is basically just not meeting the mark now around what needs to be done and see in terms of drawing the line to the objective that if Jim isn't replaced, then how do you, what are your tips around managing performance? So that's a wonderful question and they're very different from country to country, right? So in the, in the States, um, because it's pretty much matter of fact, it's, it's mm. like everybody know your salary, you're very much at will your expectations are very straightforward and it's your responsibility to, to know the job that you've been hired to do. There in some, some companies where there's a lot more, there's a training and development arm, you can get training depending on how specialized, or you have a larger group of people with a varied number of skills and the company is so deep, you can kind of get that knowledge by osmosis. You can, you know, there's people who've been there for 10, 20 years. But in New Zealand, because the, the workforce is so young and the team is so young, you're missing that maturity. So it's, they don't know what they don't know. And because a lot of it is, is very much um, group think, they think because the group says it, it's true and it's not necessarily. But going back to performance, because it's so so, so helpful in a way, it's, it's almost like the, the um, employer's job to make sure that the person knows their job. And when they don't, um, I got in trouble a lot because I ended up being really direct um, and that hurt a lot of people's feelings in some ways because, you know, Kiwis are like any other island nation. If you're not, if you're, if you're not um, 
rolling together, then you're off the island. And so, so collectively, you just learn to just either couch or talk around what you really want because you really don't want to make you mad because you can't go anywhere because you're on an island. <laughs> yeah, I can't leave. Wellington's really tiny. I don't. I'm going to see you tomorrow, so I'll be nice. Um, so it's some and some of that it, it it hinders you from actually getting to that um, radical truth, which which will make you better. And again, going back to the feelings, and it it, it it's hard to get past the feelings to actually help because it, it's 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 automatically perceived as an attack um, when it's not meant to. It's really it's there to improve, but you can't get past that because they really haven't had any practice, and so. Um, for, for me, I, 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 I turned into Elphaba really quick, like, oh my gosh, you know, no one warns the wicked. It's like, I'm not bad. I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you what you need to hear. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be mean, but like this, I have to work in truth because I'm in production. And so I, I really wish I could kind of beat around the bush, um, but I can't. And these are the things where you what your deficit is. And, and, and a lot of the times they, they really didn't like it. They, they thought they were fine. I really had when, when I started. I had one person come to me and said, I really thought I came to this company. I could do what I wanted. I'm like, really? No, <laughs> you, can't, you can't. And they were really offended and they quit and the whole thing. But I think if you take a, take, especially with a founder looking up, it's like, well, whose money is this? Like, it's not, I mean, this is, we're here to do a specific thing. And if you want to help with that, then that's great. But if you, if you can't, um, then you should definitely find somewhere else to do. But it's hard there because New Zealand's so tiny. It's like, no, I'm going to sit here and you're going to, gonna take it <laughs> you know and it's, it's it's hard it was i mean i was floored i'm like they can do what here but in the states it's like hey it's not working here's your performance plan here's i'm gonna help you but it's your job to make sure that you get to those not me you have to yeah. do it and if you're not happy then you know here's your two weeks and we're gonna agree to disagree and that's it but here they, they really take you to the mat of like you know you're it's really the employer's problem. And, and I guess that's why it's so important to uh, pick wisely and pick clear, but it's really hard when the workforce is so young, you really have no choice. You just have to grow, have them grow with you. Um, and, and uh, cause that's your people, you have to take care of them. And if they want, they want, you know, beer clock and um, massages and Wednesdays off, then by golly, if that's the people that you need, you have to, but that would never fly in the States. Um, if you're working in a team, but of course COVID changed all that. And because we're all virtual, does it really matter? And people like their free time. And, and if you're senior enough, I'm not really talking about the seniors because they really don't need us. Senior people are senior people. Here's a task they've dealt with. That's why consultants and, but it's the, it's the little kids who just start out. I just worry about because they really have a false sense of like, what does it really mean? But maybe it does need to, you know, everybody has to go through that crucible. Like I was yeah. in LA day of the 90s la was the center it was the pinnacle of all it started unraveling to canada when, when the tax incentives start flashing around the world then it wasn't just los angeles anymore and now we have to work differently and you know um new zealand is very uh which is why you know cameron and disney before you know 20th century fox came down to new zealand because the the workforce is is so inviting you guys are so amenable and you're highly skilled and the weather is great depending upon where you where you are. And the, the dollar conversion is really attractive, you know, it even gets so. And and so what's not to love if you can take that 24 hour flight um, uh, to get to you guys, it's, it's really, it's, it's really great to see. But that's the hardest thing for me because I'm pretty locked into how I operate and I, I can't, I can only flex so much. And I, I definitely have to adhere to the culture and respect that. Um, wholeheartedly because I definitely just work differently just just because I grew up in a different place. Yeah, look, I think there's some great perspectives there and <clears throat> that's a personal position of mine, arguably a rant, um, and you're probably familiar, but, you know, New Zealand is one of the lowest, if not the lowest ranked country for productivity in the OECD. And so, you know, I think we need to hear more stories about you know, what it is like to operate in those environments, not just to try and, I think, lift the level here in New Zealand, but also to get ready uh, yeah. for what you're going to face if you're going to truly export your uh, your IP and your, your vision and your and your dream out to uh, to other countries. Otherwise, it's going to be a, a disconnect. 
Yeah, it's, it's so true. And in some, in some instances, and, I, and again, I don't mean to insult it by any means, but you know, t- the tall poppy syndrome is real. And because in, 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 in the American have that lone cowboy Horatio Alger, do it on your own to expect like you, you have to be extraordinary to get to where you need to be. It's expected of you to be extraordinary in order to reach those heights of the Steve Jobs and the and and the Microsoft and the and the the Metas, you have to kind of be that um, uh, that one in a million, right? And that's celebrated and unheralded. But in New Zealand, on a day by day, I watch people very microaggress slowly into you have to conform into what we think you should be and don't go any higher or else you're going to hear about it. And I've watched people just quietly be bullied around me from not and we're not talking about the playground. We're talking about um, the work we're talking about, these are people in their thirties, just really using playground tactics to really squash people's spirit. And those who don't have the fortitude or wherewithal to kind of brace themselves against that, that is definitely a psychological barrier. And I'm sure most of the founders, if not all, I know Derek used to talk about it a lot about hard it's for him to get just people buy in to say, hey, I'm going to open up something different because it's not, I, I want to work at something, it doesn't exist, so I'm going to build it. Um, and that, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't easy for him. I think he was South African by birth, so I think that he, you know, he only came as a teenager, so I think he had a little bit of grit in him um, before, you know, in coming over. But even, even in him, you know, I, he still, even because he was here for the half of his life, I still be a little tentative, like, I can't say that, or I can't do that. And, so they'll say something or I can't, you know, I just, I, I heard a lot of can'ts because of what people may think. And, and for me, um, that's exactly opposite because, you know, being, being a black woman in America, uh, if I went about what people thought of me, I wouldn't be where I was, but I was always an outlier. And so even in New Zealand, you know, taking, taking a even harder hit, being a woman, being a woman of color in that environment where there's so few of us with a voice, it was really hard for people and they didn't even understand they had the bias until I showed up and they reacted against it. But because I was so used to it, because I'd done the work in Los Angeles and I had seen how the, the kind of homogeneous um, crew, uh, male crew had already acted. It was just about the efficiency and doing the work. And so I was used to those kind of microaggressions, but it was, it's, it's overwhelming because you, again, you don't know you have it until somebody outside of you confronts you with your, your bias. So that's the that's the perfect on ramp to talk, I think, about inclusion effects and um, really just your view of clearly an area, you know, of, of all dimensions that just yeah. needs different thinking and different awareness. You know, the unconscious, the subconscious, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, if you were describing to somebody, I guess the the, the core principles that you're beginning to evolve from the people that you've talked to, I think about 89, you said that, um, yes. that have, that have yeah. shared views, which is a, it's a very good sample size, particularly given, you know, their status and, and, and you know, what they've been doing and their experiences. Where, where are you landing in terms, I mean, let's just take, you know, we're not nearly, you know, on the path to, to, to actually uh, trying to solve this problem in any shape or form. So we'll take that as a given. So where are you landing on the sort of top points or the, the top elements for people to sit there and go, am I doing this authentically? Um, and the answer is no. I would suggest, generally speaking, if you really ask that question honestly, what yeah. would you suggest based on these conversations you actually consider at any level, really, just as the founder or leader of an organisation to, to begin to get some more um, impactful, authentic um, initiatives into your business around this issue? That's a wonderful question. And so for me, I decided, because because again, there are, many, there are multiple points. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm still an army of one. I'm starting to... to um, to really embrace, uh, which I probably brought with me from New Zealand, which is um, you're stronger together in a sense of like finding like-minded people to propel the work forward. And, um, and, and I have, because of I reached out to that network, that network is very powerful. And like, you know, Sheena is a member of the Academy. So is Andrew Roberts, the Academy has Academy Gold. They're already doing work in this space, you know, on the filmmaker side, you know, Ava DuBray and the governors, they already have like databases for for diverse crews to kind of come in and uh, help because 
movie making tends to be really family oriented. You know, it's its own little family. They actually call themselves family because like, I know you, I trust you, you look like me, I'm going to teach you because I feel safe with you. And when you're dealing with people outside of that, um, that bubble, it's really hard to kind of get in there. And even when you're in there, it's, it's not a safe space because they're going kind to, of depending upon where you are and how much power you have, which probably not when you start out, it can be really uncomfortable, almost to the point, it's already uncomfortable starting from the ground up anyway, because that's their, 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 the, the quiet hazing of like, can you take the madness? Um, but I'm hoping, they, hoping they've gotten better with that. But bringing in divorce voices is so much more powerful because you're so much stronger because there are more elements. And it's and, and, and you get kind of stagnant when you're talking to yourself in the same way with the same people you grew up with. It's just not as broad, it's not universal. You may think it is, but it's really limiting. It's limiting for everybody. Um, Cause the people the you know, and, and especially in American for the, like the last hundred years, which is why I love the boom with the streaming service and you know Netflix casting and all those things are trying to bring in more verse. I can I can tell when things are 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 written and directed and and acted from my point of view. There's a richness to it. There's an understanding that's not there when you're seeing that little black kid on Stranger Things without a family for a whole season. I'm like, oh, so he gets to ride off on his bike. Where does he go at night? Nice. I mean, those are, we pay attention to those things. Like, but if I'm a right, if I'm a white writer. I don't know where that little black kid goes. I don't know any black kids. I don't, but I'm gonna go and talk to my owner writer because I understand. So, but but what what does that influence have to people who look like the little black kid? Oh, so I'm not important enough to even have a house. I just gotta ride around the bike and show up. Wow. Show up with the yeah. group team. I mean, that's a that's a level and perspective that I'd never even considered before. At the, you know, of course, you know, and and when everybody tells you that. Um, you know, you're the top of the food chain, and everything you do is right. And then of course I come in and challenge all those things by just um, the the experience that I have. And sometimes I have to stop back because I'm always challenged. I'm constantly challenged by the, the little babies. And it was, it was, it was, I had to kind of count to 10 a couple of times. I'm like, how, how do you think you can, <laughs> you have a fraction of the experience, but, but you split it this way. If I was a 55 year old white guy, I would never hear any of this from you. But because I look like this and because your perception of what I should be and not be or are enclosed in what, how you define me, that's not my problem. I'm coming here to do this job and I'm going to do it well because I don't know any other way to do it. And that's confronting for some people. Other people love it, but it's hard because they didn't think of themselves. Am I the bad guy? Like everybody's a hero of their own story. And of course, you know, I'm going to quote Ben Barnes uh, and say, you know, make me your villain. I'm okay with that too, because I'm just here to um, to do the job. Because I, I, you know, it was rare that I'd be invited out to, for 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 family things. I mean, because again, uh, it was very closed and cloistered because it's very, um, you know, tribal uh, in a way. And so there were no, there was no, there was no um, repercussions for me because I was always an outsider. So what happens, you know, when I was in the environment? They would quietly ostracize you if you weren't conforming to what they wanted. I call it the echoing of the Amish shunning, um, and I, I don't. That, that's what that's how that's what it feel like. But because I was nearly included in the first place, none of those tactics worked on me, and that made them mad. I'm like, what? <laughs> that didn't work. Then how can we control her? And the answer was, you cannot. I'm here to do a job and help you. And so that wanting to knowing knowing what was was best or doing my job and running counterpoint to people you know with their hands up well uh, but I'm like well why why the why the pushback we're here rolling the same place you just don't want to hear it because I look this way or you don't like my attitude or my accent I'm confused because I'm really good at what I do so what really is it and it's hard for them to kind of really, well, maybe, maybe it is an unconscious bias that they'd like to remain unconscious, but now I force it into consciousness because I'm in front of them and I'm not going to back down. And that's why they call me the wall at Lightstorm for many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so on the wall though, I mean, you know, I've had this question myself and, and organizations that I'm governing or, or leading as well as questions from our community is, you know, when you've got this bias that's been there for so long and you are trying to take an active um, correction path, there's just automatically a dearth of, you know, you talked about capability, which has triggered me on this. Is like, how do you, what are your views on how you get a shortlist 
which you know actually recognizes that the capability side has been uh, you know discriminated against for so many years that you're unlikely to actually get you know um, the right mix of diversity into that short list. Oh, you're, you're you're oh my gosh, you're, you're bringing back memories. I mean, it's so true. <laughs> During lockdown, we couldn't just, you know, pull the liver and bring in somebody from the UK or whatever. You know, we just we we there was no longer access to those things. So we had to work from within. And that just meant getting those fresh babies and bringing them into the to the studio and just train them up and open that structure and the mentorship of the people who were there maybe two days before them will help. I'm like, oh my gosh, See, they're all babies. They're babies leading babies. But that's all we had, you know? And I'm just- and, <laughs> Babies, and, babies sitting babies, I love that. Babies. And um, they were just so gifted, but again, it's, it's more than um, keyboards and software to manage people. Cause people, you have to start with kind of knowing yourself and what your own triggers are. And, and um, that takes a, a maturity level and, and having to look into the abyss that a lot of people aren't used to. And they think that leadership is very different and, and, and fun and sexy when they do it. And it's like, this isn't fun at all. And some people don't have the temperament for it because you have to be have clarity of thought. You have to be super honest because, and you're dealing with people's livelihood and their lives and their perception and their career. That's a great responsibility. And you you won't take it lightly. And um, when you when you when you haven't had time to even know who you are yet, it's really challenging to have that person um, manage. Now, look, I saw some phenomenal um, leaders or growing into leaders uh, at where where I was working at the company, and I could see the potential of them. But they would still kind of snap back into their age limit because they haven't. And for for me and my growth they hadn't had the experience of it. So I couldn't keep holding them account or, or to a, to a, to a um, standard that they were gonna not be able to see yet because they haven't gotten to that point yet. And it wasn't fair for me. And I had to kind of tone it back a little bit which is when I go back down to my two year mark. I'm like, okay, well let's see what the next half a year is gonna be as they transition into what they're gonna become because they're the ones that have to do the work. They're the they're the backbone of any company is your people, and you have to keep them happy, and you have to make sure that they are supported. Um, but that's it's really hard because they will just they will just not want to do it, or they would think that it was not um, if they couldn't see if they couldn't see past their own understanding or experience, then there was nothing I could say or do to convince them otherwise. Because my point of reference is something that they can't see. So I had to step back and say, okay, well, what is going to be true for you? I know it's international standard, but what's going to work for you? Because we're not international. We're here and this is what we have. And so how can we make you the best that you can be? And, and that just meant for me, in some cases, slowing all the way down and really give time and space uh, to do that. And so once A44 was acquired, they definitely did have the resources to kind of, okay, we're going to slow it down so that our team can make it the best it can, it can be. And we have the time to, to time to do that. And so that was really great for them. But, um, but yeah, it's hard you, because. That. Yeah, it's incredibly hard because then I guess you have that um, element we talked about before, which is, you know, you have got some progress around that um, diversity in that mix You've given them, you know, because in your scenario, you've got the, the ability to, to really, you know, you have to plug development and, and capability yep. into everybody because it's, it's, it's an immature sort of, but then you reach a point back to your getting the straight line to the outcome where some of them just by nature of, you know, the world and, and natural elements are not going to then, and then how is that not seen as, you know, further uh, kind of discrimination or avoidance of, of trying to create a diverse culture, right? It, it comes up pretty quick, I'd imagine, after that it's, point. It's, it's really true because, you know, New Zealand, it's, it's still a tale of two cities, right? There's still, you know, there's the, the Pakina and, 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 the, and, and the Maori and the Pacifica and, and never the twain so meet. I mean, you know, at what I, I was really, really rare that I would see a mixer balance and it would try but it, it was really, really hard to kind of integrate those two worlds because you just, they're just so different. 
you know, they're just, those, those, those are really, really different things. And so that is always going to be such, such a challenge. I mean, it's still a challenge here in the, in, in the Americas and there's the populations are a lot larger. Of course, our history is very different, but um, there's, we're, we're still colonized countries and, you know, and, and we do definitely still share those similarities and those, those biases, whether we like to admit it or not. It's true. I lived it. I've been there. Um, I've been in places in New Zealand where people didn't see me because I don't know why. And um, I got used to just being and running a studio. So I was used to a, a level of respect to people knowing me, but out there in the other, the, I just was a brown face and they would see me or not, um, which was also like, a, also confronting and having to adjust to that as well. And so I, I usually kind of was very isolated um, with that um, and which, which I had to kind of work through um, but I definitely can breathe a little bit easier now that I, I, I'm back in, in, back in the States and can be around people that kind of look like me because I was not that. I, I, I used to laugh and joke when I was here with my daughter the first time I had back 10 years ago. I was like, oh, my gosh, it's me and my daughter and that chick on Spartacus. We're the only black women in Wellington. Like, <laughs> I just remember saying, like, oh, my God, it's just three of us. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> oh. Um. I, I think you're on a, um, you know, I mean, just with your background and a, an incredibly exciting and challenging journey with Inclusion FX. So we're nearly out of time. Like we've got a couple of minutes here. It's gone so fast. So I'm actually feeling quite tired in a really good way because uh, you've taken us on a whirlwind of, of topics and, and um, you know, with such credibility. So thank you for that. But uh, okay. I guess um, to round out the, the hour, um, Inclusion FX, you know, as the founder, um, bringing it back to where our territory three organization sort of centers. What are your hopes and aspirations and goals for that? And, um, and what are the biggest challenges as the founder of, of that you see ahead um, to achieve those? I really, I really want to try to move the, the needle to increase the um, diverse uh, voices and especially specifically the tech space. And that just starts with base like education. So I'm going to work, work with a number of nonprofits to kind of go into the schools and um, seeing how we can kind of at a grassroot level just started training people up and getting them in, into the workforce. I, I mean, there's so much work now. It's, it's almost a boon, you know, with the streaming services and Marvel releasing a, a show every week or so. I mean, that, that work is never going to die down, especially you, you have work up to 2030, pretty much, if not beyond. Um, the work is there, just making sure that there, there are people that access it. So I definitely am looking for, for partners about recruiting and working with the big, big studios and just becoming just a part of that, um, that, uh, that team to just increase the, the um, and giving them support while they're there, you know, instead of having to kind of be the only one like me, really when they get there, give them the support and the mentorship necessary to succeed in those roles. That's really what I want to see next. Wow, that's a, that's a big agenda and I, I really wish you um, all the best with that and of course anybody in our community or if we can help in any way, you know, you, you should definitely reach out. Um, look, it's been a treat to chat with you. Um, sadly, our paths didn't cross when you were based in Wellington and you very graciously agreed to do this just via messaging um, without yeah. knowing our organisation and who we are. So thank you for that because um, I know how busy your time is. I hope we see you back here in New Zealand sometime soon. Um, and I think particularly grateful for your candor around, you know, just basically putting some of those challenges out to our community about what it's like. And, you know, I'll, I'll say it, you know, much faster pace, much more intense, but, you know, much more mature to your point, uh, industry side versus here. But I, I still don't think that leaves us with an excuse to say, well, we can just try and enter that world. Uh, exporting our, our IP and so forth without actually respecting and, and, and altering and just just getting a bit um, harder nosed about what we have to do. So yeah. um, I wish you all the well, all the best with that. And thank yeah. you so much for being with us. Um, for yeah. the community, thanks for joining us. And remember, um, there's so much in this talk today that if you think there's one of your colleagues or someone else in our community who couldn't make it today, we will be on demand. Uh, and available within uh, about 90 minutes uh, of the close. So you can point folks to territory3 forward slash academy, uh, territory3.community forward slash academy, and uh, Audrey will be up there um, in the content then. So thanks so much. Enjoy the rest Thank of your you. evening, I guess it is. And Thank thanks you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.